Hey everyone, welcome to Groundhog Day, PPP, second round. This is how it feels, right? <laughs> Even my printer can't <laughs> function well today. So um, we're gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over to Adam. He's got a, an explainer thing on the front end of this thing, and then we've got a fair amount of questions that are rolling in as well. So um, just as a reminder, if you would use the Q&A button to hit questions and answers that way we can archive them if you have silly comments or whatever use the chat button but try not to use the chat button for questions if you would um, we don't have a way of archiving that and we're we're assembling a nice little library of questions and trying to make sure that we keep all those things so anyway uh, welcome everybody Adam take it away yeah um, you know, I've received a couple, had a couple conversations this week that I thought would be beneficial when we touched on some of this stuff a little bit in the last webinar. But um, when it comes to did we need the money or not in terms of the certification process around um, what's going to happen when I go apply for loan forgiveness and I had to certify that I was harmed, you know. My feeling on that is that the you know there was there was some press obviously about Shake Shack and you know I think there was another hotelier that was a Trump donor that took some money that that made the press I think he actually was even the biggest um, beneficiary of funds and you know they really were pretty specific in the law that there wasn't there wasn't a need to prove that you had alternative sources of funding available so other than maybe some um public uproar for you know a billionaire getting a government handout i mean that happens every day of the week it just happens to have happened on a really aggressive um basis uh now i just still feel like it's going to be really difficult to prove um economic harm or not i mean you still have kind of the ethical question that you can ask yourself around, should I take the money or not? Um, if I actually don't believe that I'm going to have any harm or I, I'm just absolutely not going to be harmed. But I gotta tell you, I just feel like that's very hard to predict. And I'm gonna go back to the example that I use um, with construction industry and you happen to service home builders. I mean, the clients that we have that are, that are in that business are still going like gangbusters um, because they're fulfilling on uh, backlog that was already in existence and committed contracts that were already in existence. But in terms of third and fourth quarter, because builders have held off on producing spec inventory um, because people aren't buying houses, I, you know, their harm is going to happen afterwards. So there's no, um, so if you think about it, okay, I wasn't harmed during the cover period but I was harmed afterwards, just the way things um, shook out. I mean, you know, I guess they, they might be able to lay some people off and, and end up in this, at the same answer. Uh, but at the same time, it, you know, it's, it, I just feel like it's hard for anybody to predict whether or not um, they were harmed. Um, it, with, were you harmed because of the crisis or were you harmed just because you were harmed? So I just feel like it's gonna be di very difficult um, to prove one way or the other. And again, if you just think about what, like, just think about the army of people that would be required um, to prove to prove the case. So I just, you know, I, and what really triggered me on this one is that I got forwarded an email from a bank that basically went into chapter and verse, do you really, really need the money or not? And I just, you know, I, I think it's going to be up to the bank to, to, uh, grant forgiveness and I just don't see a scenario where they're going to be super super um, onerous about uh, proving whether or not you need the money I think they'll be a little bit diligent in terms of did you spend it on allowable items but not necessarily on whether or not you need the money so I feel like that's just kind of a bunch of fear-mongering um, that's going on right now uh, related to a few high-profile cases of uh, publicly traded companies that that hit the hit the press um, so that, that was one. I think the second is, I had a lot of questions about from people that received um, EIDL grants and how that relates to 
the Paycheck Protection Program um, forgiveness, the, the way the law reads, um, it's a little bit confusing. So I think this is going to be one of those stay tuned. But the way that the law reads is that um, your maximum amount of a PPP loan is two and a half times average payroll costs plus what you received in an EIDL loan. So that was going to assume, I think, when they wrote the law that you already received the EIDL, EIDL, EIDL loan. And when it comes to the forgiveness section, the forgiveness section is completely silent on EIDL loan proceeds. The only thing that it says is the maximum amount of loan forgiveness is, you know, A, the principal amount of the loan, and then it goes into all the calculations around how you had to spend the money. So I think what's going to be very, what I'm really curious about is you've got a loan document that was for PPP funds and then you got EIDL funds. You know, you're not supposed to use the funds for the same purpose, but if you look at BGW as an example, you know, there, there's actually a very good chance that we would spend more than, than the funding available on payroll and everything else still within the allowable limits. Um, so if we had received the IDL money, then, you know, in theory, that would read that it should be forgiven too, but yet you've got a loan document for an amount. And I, I don't think we've got any clients necessarily, maybe we will in the second round of funding that received, um, EIDL grant money and loan money prior to their uh, PPP funding. So I, I think it's going to be, I would assume that the grant, hey, that's just going to be forgiven. It's not going to be, it's not going to reduce your PPP forgiveness amount. But if you actually got funding and you uh, were still within the confines of spending it appropriately pursuant to the guidance, yeah, I don't know how the bank's going to deal with that because that, I think that'll, blow their mind because they're, they're looking at the loan document side. Um, so that was, that was really the, the second thing. Um, then the, the, the third thing, and I promise I'll shut up here in a second so we can get to questions, Gary. Um, the third thing is with respect to round two, um, I think we've also heard that there was such a high volume of um, applications because everybody was ready to go this time around that the SBA systems had been crashing. Um, I don't think that uh, impacts whether or not somebody's going to get funding or not. Um, it's still, you know, first come, first serve basis. I think what, what does matter is, you know, probably where were you in the queue of, hey, submitted application and then it crashed and then resubmitted and, you know, blah, blah, all that stuff. All, all I've heard is that it's just been a lot slower to get ETRAN numbers, which is, you know, kind of your second golden ticket. The first golden ticket is I made it through underwriting. Second golden ticket is I got an ETRAN number. That's, that appears to be a slower process this time around due to the volume um, of applications. Perfect. Uh, anything else on that? No, I got a couple other things will probably come up in the Q&A, but fire away. Okay, cool. Um... Yeah, I, I, the only thing I'd say, too, is we've gotten a, a, a few uh, panic notes even this morning early um, from folks that wondered about, hey, I haven't heard anything from my big bank. I was in early, haven't heard. They're silent. Should I apply someplace else? And pretty much everything that I've heard, there's only one other place that may even take any additional applications right now, and it's uh, UCB, United Community Bank. Um, and even there, uh, in talking with Thomas McTeer this morning, he said, man, um, we can take it, but there are no guarantees. And he talked about the same thing with the, uh, you know, the crashing of the SBA site. So that would yeah. be the other thing where we've had people have, that have asked, hey, is it even, am, am I putting myself in jeopardy for doing multiple lines in multiple fishing ponds, if you will? So you might want to address that too before mm -hmm. the next question. I did, I, did, I did get asked that question actually, um, tail, end of, tail end of last week. You know, I, 
if you think about mechanically what would happen, you know, the, the way that it reads is you're not supposed to basically sign two loan documents for the same funding. But I, if you think about the mechanics of what would happen is that, you know, I'm, I submitted applications with two banks. One bank gets me an ETRAN number. Second bank then gets in right behind it. My assumption is that it would just get rejected um, based on the fact that, hey, this, this thing already exists within our systems, or this, this, custom, this EIN already exists within our systems. I would hope it's that automated. Um, and even then, even if that didn't happen, then you just don't do the loan. <laughs> so I don't think there's really, I, I can't, nobody's told me this for a fact, but just thinking through, well, how, the mechanics of how would that happen? I just, I don't see a scenario where someone says, oh, the, your application was in with two banks, therefore you're disqualified altogether. Nobody's told me that's the case. I would think that it would be, and we haven't had anybody that, that, that that's the case. I would think that it's just, um, you're, you know, you, you got, if you got an e-tran with one bank, you're probably going to get rejected on the second application, I would, I would think. I don't know that for a fact, but I would think that would be the case. All right, here's the next question, and this is from Tom, and it ties into this. Uh, regarding PPP application process, the information about the second round is unclear about applying. If I applied the fir for the first round, do I need to reapply for the second round, or will my original application be sufficient? If you got it through underwriting, then your original application should be being submitted now. I mean, it'd be great to get confirmation from your bank about that, but everybody that we've dealt with in round two only submitted a new application if they literally switched banks. Everybody that was sticking with the first, the first bank that they were with um, just went with the application that they had on the assumption that it had been, on the assumption that it had already made it through underwriting. All right, next question is from Marguerite. We got 70% of our requested amount. We're happy with that. Are there restrictions on this money? Yes, uh, and you can talk about that again, but in, is it really a grant? Uh, and this is the ideal, not PPP. Uh, we will receive more money, or will we, will we sorry, <laughs> will we receive more money that uh, we will have to manage? I have an independent contractor who's unemployed. Has anybody gotten PUA money? A few questions there. Uh, so go in reverse order on the, on the P. PUA side, um, the fund I have, I don't know one way or the other on that, other than the funds were spark, supposed to start hitting people's bank accounts, I thought last week. Um, so I don't know the answer, but I thought it was supposed to be last week. That's the enhanced unemployment benefits um, from the federal government. With respect to, I think the question was around the EIDL um, grant. If you only receive 70% of what you requested on the grant side, it's because it was on a per employee basis. Um, so it's a thousand bucks per employee. So if you, if you thought you were gonna get 10, but you only reported seven employees, you only were gonna get seven. If you thought you were gonna get 10, you only reported three employees, you're gonna get three. If you thought you were gonna get 10, you have 20 employees, you're gonna get 20, or you're gonna get 10, but then the loan will be for um, you know, an amount requested that I think is the internal calculation based on what your um, expenses, reported expenses were in the application process. So just yeah, so using, the question is, is it truly a grant and are there restrictions tied to that money as an EIDL? Um, on the grant component itself, it is supposed to be used for payroll. That's why they do, did it on an employee count basis. But how you're how somebody is going to prove that if you didn't receive PPP funds, anybody's guess, <laughs> um, because there's nobody to do the inspection. The bank was supposed to do the inspection, but if you didn't receive PPP funds, there is no bank loan, so there's nobody to do an inspection on you. If you receive the AIDL loans and you got the grant and then you're just left with the loan at the end, I mean, I can't see, I can't see somebody wasting their time to do an inspection on that um, either. And just, you know, to give you kind of an idea of the expense amount, you know, the one, the one client that I know definitely received money that I'm very familiar with, you know, their, their expenses 
annualized were probably $1.5 million and they received 500. So they received effectively a third of their um, annual expenses. Oh, and also restrictions on the loan amount. You can't use it to refinance existing debt. You can't use it. You're not supposed to use it for new equipment purchases, stuff like that. I, but again, I don't know how that's going to be proven. So here's a, a comment that came in from Thomas McTeer of United Community Bank. And he said, yes, ETRAN will reject you if you are approved by another bank. So that's the fail safe. Okay, got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, the government Thanks. got something right. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Thank you, Thomas. This is from Kathy. This is regarding renters not paying. One of my tenants was non-essential and he closed for the month of April. He says he can't pay if he's closed and expects business to be off and is asking for a reduction of rent amount once he starts back. Another's a restaurant who's operating as a pickup or carry out. I know he's struggling. He is a new tenant from Thailand operating on a green card, so he has no access to any relief funds, according to him. What can I do? My property income has to pay mortgage insurance taxes, and with maintenance issues, I'm unable to make personal withdrawals. I mean, it, you're, you know, you're, if you're looking for funding, your route would be, um, couple different spots you know first off the EIE the the EIDL loan application um, you're not going to get the grant because you don't have any employees but you could conceivably get a loan amount to cover um, economic damages and cover the mortgage interest and then the only other the only other route would be um, to uh, just work with your bank to see if you can do um, some rent abatement pay payments on that note though, especially if you're a landlord associated with a hospitality business that's, that, that has asked for rent abatement or has just stopped paying you, you know, I did, I, I would say that, look, if, if you're a restaurant and you receive PPP money, you're going to struggle to spend the money anyway. So pay your landlord. <laughs> I mean, you're going to like, that's, it doesn't make sense to not pay your landlord because that amount's going to be forgiven because you're struggling to make the payroll number. Uh, work. So I, I would go ahead and pay the landlord if they receive PP money, which I think would be applicable here too, is that I got it, the, the green card going to be a problem, but the other one, you know, if they receive funding, they should, they, they really should pay you. And that's kind of a, that to me would be part of my indicator on whether or not I'm going to then change the locks or not is how they're, how they behave upon receiving funds. All right, here's the next question from Barry. Um, I read an, an article in yesterday's J of A online that warns PPP borrowers must make the good faith certification while taking into account their current business activity and ability to access other sources of liquidity sufficient to support their ongoing operations in a manner that is not significantly detrimental to the business. This seems to be a change from the borrowing standard several weeks ago. If our company has a good cash balance and, great, and, and a great bank credit, are we in jeopardy of having to pay the loan back? I, I think it goes back to what I said, what I said at the beginning, which is, I, you know, it, you, can, you can make an ethical, the decision on the certification is an ethical question. And I'm not going to, and the reason that I feel like it's, it, it's hard to make that judgment call is it's extremely, it, it's very unpredictable in terms of what's going to happen and what the new normal actually looks like um, in the future. So I think that's really a, a personal um, decision that you have to make when it comes to the, you know, the court, not an attorney, but um, my my attorney friends know that I really wish that I was one because I love arguing. <laughs> um, how are you going to prove again? How are you going to prove it? Like, what's the standard by which you would prove that um, the resource? Like, like just play this out, right? How you would have to prove that and the resources required. So in this case, the company has 
um, significant cash balance sitting in their checking account. Okay, got it. You know, that, that was presumably because I wanted to have a working capital um, nest egg uh, of three months. You know, I'm trying to be very responsible and very conservative uh, with the cash. Well, um, I don't know, have my accounts receivable days started to suffer a little bit? Where I, where I think in the future that cash balance is gonna get, get into down. You know, you'd have to look at, well, what's, what's my sales volume <laughs> look like for the third and fourth quarter? Like, am I, gonna have, if, am I gonna suffer loss? I literally had a call with the client um, the, today that, um, or literally right before this webinar, they're actually at this moment in time up 30% over last year but know based on demand that they're basically going to have zero sales in the third and fourth quarter. So, I mean, then you carry that type of scenario forward. Well, what, what if I didn't have cash in the bank account because I actually maintain the lean uh, balance sheet, but my personal net worth is highly liquid in millions of dollars. Um, it, like, is the inspection gonna dip, dip into my personal level? And it still comes back to who's actually gonna perform the inspection. So I think it really just comes down to um, what the reality of what will happen is that, hey, you'll have to make an ethical judgment call. I think that ethical judgment calls um, a very difficult one because you don't necessarily know what the future holds for you. Nobody can. Um, and in terms of the inspection process, who's gonna inspect? So I think it's just gonna come down to the court of public opinion. Um, at that point where if it's somebody like Shake Shack or whatever, <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're going to get outed. And the way that they get outed is that, you know, either the press reports it or, you know, in, if they have a financial statement, it's going to be a disclosure in their financial statement. So I just, I feel that's, that's going to be a tough one. <laughs> uh, tough, not meaning um, tough in the sense of, uh, hey, it's hard to make the call on it. It's just more like, look, it's an ethical question at the end of the day. And secondly, you know, the language did read that you didn't have to have access to other funds. That's the law. Everything that's happened subsequent to that is just opinion. Like until they change the law. All right, cool. I'm going to go to the Q&As uh, on the on the program here. So what's the definition of FTE for loan forgiveness? Um, there's not one. <laughs> so it, uh, there's just the time periods. So, you know, whatever you used for your application, you would use for uh, the forgiveness um, calculation. In the absence of that, I would just look at, you know, 30 hours a week or whatever the ACA um, calculation is. All right, this is from Jennifer. We have employees uh, that have been laid off due to COVID. We're unaware if we will be approved for PPP and we can't put them back on the payroll until we know we're approved. What happens if we're approved and the employees were not on the payroll for eight weeks? If you were approved and you never got them on payroll, sorry, you were approved, funded, and then you never got them to come back on payroll, you know, it, it's either a loan or you got to give the money back. Like you got to actually spend the money to get forgiveness. Um, and the only way you're going to spend the money is if you get the employees to come back. This is from Neil. If we receive the money on 430 and we have monthly payroll to run, also pay rent for April and utilities, can we use the funds we receive to pay? Yeah, in that scenario, you're going to want to go to probably a weekly payroll just to be, and again, if you go back to, I'm going to have to prove something, you know, you, you're likely going to need to prove that you paid the payroll versus accruing it. So you're going to want to plan to probably modify your payroll um, terms. All right. This is from Denise. Is the hundred thousand dollar salary cap for salary dollars only, or are the benefits and taxes also limited by the cap of a hundred thousand? It's salary dollars only. Okay, can a company participate in PPP, PUA, and unemployment work share program? 
Um, yeah. Yeah, you can. I mean, but at the same time, you just got to, with on the PPP side of the house, you just got to make sure that you are actually deploying the money and obviously, you know, unemployment offsets against that. All right, this is Janice or Janice. Sorry if I'm screwing up your name pronunciation. Uh, we may need to let go or furlough one of our 18 employees. What percentage of loan forgiveness will be eligible? Will we be eligible for in that case? Um, it, yeah, if you can't get the head count, remember you got multiple test periods, you know, either what you use in the beginning, um, 215, 2019 through four, two, through 630, 2019 or 11, 2020 um, through 229, 2020. And assuming that all of those were to equal 18, which is what you have now and you're letting one go, um, the way that it reads right now, it just would be, you know, 17 eighteenths um, would be forgiven and one eighteenth would not. Assuming that you met every other test that was in there. All right, this is from Megan. I understand the amount of our PPP forgiveness is reduced by the amount of the EIDL loan, but we do not know, or, but we do know that, oh, no, no, sorry. <laughs> I need to get some more go-go juice in me. <laughs> do we know if that includes the initial 10K? Uh, we talked about, that's what we hit on in the beginning. Um, the way the law reads again is that, um, you, you know, you get the, you get, you get the money, PP happens, your EDL money gets added to that. That's the total amount of the loan now. And then the maximum forgiveness amount is up to the principal um, balance of the loan, assuming that it met all the eligible expenses. So that would imply that it's forgiven um, or, or, or a component of it could be for a component of it could be forgiven. And I think the logistics on this one that's going to be difficult is that the like a bank certifying to forgive an amount that is in excess of funds that they disperse through their own bank. I, the logistics of that, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering about that. <laughs> like, I think it's going to be easy for the bank to say, <clears throat> loan document, <laughs> evidence, <laughs> funds received, we're square. I think what's going to be difficult for a bank to wrap their arms around, again, the way that the law currently reads would be loan doc got money after the fact. <laughs> so now I'm forgiving more than I actually loaned in the first place. That's, I think that's going to be sticky. Makes sense. Next question for the PPP forgiveness. Do the ancillary payroll related items count as payroll costs? For example, workers' comp insurance, ADP fees, owner's life insurance, et cetera. Nope. That, you just got to be thinking health and retirement. And finally, on that, from that same anonymous attendee, att additionally, what bonuses given to employees under the $100,000 limit? There's no restrictions on that. So it's salary, salary. Current, right. current from, change that, but salary, salary. Okay, this is from Melissa. We have employees whose earnings vary because of commissions. We've been told by a CPA firm that the max we can include in our total forgiveness is $15,385 per person, 100,000 divided by 52 times eight but the employees may still make less than a hundred thousand for the year. What do you think the right answer is? Um, a firm said the same about rent and we can only include eight weeks worth and can't prepay rent. Well, again, it goes back to, it's going to be cash basis accounting. So, you know, I don't know how you prove that one way or the other. Um, and you're trying to just deploy the money. Um, when, when it comes to the $15,000 number, you know, the, the thought process was, hey, we don't want to make anybody um, rich. So it, there could be some guidance that comes out that says the maximum amount per employee is this number. That's possible, <laughs> which is why the advice that we've been giving our clients is that if you're going to do something different, wait a couple weeks to see if there's more guidance around the forgiveness component. But 
in this specific instance, um, I'm going to swear again, Gary, <laughs> um, that's bullshit because you're basically saying, you're telling me that I can't pay the person the money that they earn. And if you look at their dang W2 last year, the person made 60 grand. They just happen to make it, you know, this way. So it seems very hard again to prove one way or the other um, when you've got somebody that you paid in excess of the $15,000 number unless there was a fact pattern associated with it that you actually paid them more than $100,000 last year. So if they were on your exclusion list last year, I would, you know, I think it's safe to assume if you paid them a commission that, you know, you're, got, you're not going to win that argument. But if they weren't on your exclusion list and this, this just happened to be something that they earned, I don't know. Um, you know, hopefully it's not in this next payroll and you've got a couple weeks to buy it. But right now there's no, nobody said exactly how you calculate um, the maximum amount other than it's $100,000 annualized. And it just so happens that, um, you know, depending on which way you do it, 100 grand divided by 52 times eight, um, or it's really 56 days, frankly. So is it $100,000 divided by 365 times 56? Nobody said anything about that. So nobody really knows at this point. Um, so what we've been telling our clients is just use the number for estimating purposes only um, and back off anybody that you know is going to make more than $100,000. But independent of that, we don't know at this point. So the next question is from Rob. And I'm going back to, and frankly, wow, I wouldn't want to have to be the person that told Gary, hey, dude, I know you would do this bonus, but because I want to maximize the forgiveness amount, it's all in our best interest. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to pay it to you now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is from Robert. Is an ETRAN number the same as the loan number? No, I mean, I think it, well, in this specific instance, I mean, a loan number is going to come from the bank. Um, and then the SBA has a loan number that they're assigned to it, I believe. But the ETRAN number means, hey, you're in, you're in with the SBA. So I think that's like the step where your funds got reserved. This is from Christine. I applied and submitted PPP for two, to two different banks during the second round. What should I do when and if I receive an ETRAN for one of these institutions? Uh, that got hit at the begin. That got hit on hit on in the beginning, which is um, the second ETRAN is going to get rejected. So I guess you could once you get an ETRAN, you could call the other bank and say, "Hey, don't submit me." The chances are you were already submitted, so they're just going to get rejected. <clears throat> this is from Robert. Will lenders look at PPP recipients' personal net worth as a factor to in determining if other funds were able to qualify for a loan? That goes, I can't believe that'd be a scenario where that happened. And, and I think that there's no scenario where your bank, again, think about it, just think about it from this perspective. You know, if I have a high personal net worth or I have a low personal net worth, I mean, it's really relative to, well, what's also my expense structure associated with that, you know? And secondly, I just don't see a scenario where you've got a great long-term relationship with a bank and they decided that they were going to apply overly draconian <laughs> standards to the forgiveness process for a loan for a loan that they don't freaking want that's unsecured. So unless the government makes them do something, which I just can't imagine <laughs> um, is going to happen, then I, I just I think all this value <laughs> about could you get money from somebody else is a red herring um, to scare, to scare people right now. Cause it's just, again, it's just not provable. This is from Heather is SBA now accepting applications from non-lending agencies such as cabbage. I don't know the answer to that question. I think that what would, well, my speculation would be that, um, if Cabbage filled out the application um, that was opened up and they were approved, then yes. But if they did not do that, then I'll, I don't think they could. 
This is from Karen. Any guide, are there any guidelines during this time for sending in sales tax and quarterly tax returns? Uh, it's specific to the state. In North Carolina, um, you're still supposed to be sending it in, but they waive the penalty, I think, associated with late filing and late payment. But the interest still applies because that's North Carolina general statute. So a lot would have to change. This is from Laura. Is there any way to check the status of application? I submitted my application through Wells Fargo on April 16th. Not, I mean, the bank, your, your banking portal or a personal relationship is the only way you're going to check the status. And, and as, as Gary and I mentioned that, you know, right now the system's crashing. So the bank really can't check it. Uh, very well either at this point. This is from Anonymous. Are there are the eight weeks counted based on the payroll schedule or cash spent? We got the loan on the 20th, but payroll covered the week of the 20th is two weeks after that. 20, it, well, remember that the, the period is 56 days. It, it's 56 days from the funding date. So in that case, if you receive the funds on the 20th, um, it's plus, it, it's 56, it's 20, 20th, and then it's 56 day after that. Sorry if that sounded kind of confusing and muddled. Um, but in terms of what's the eligible expense, again, it goes back to cash versus accrual based accounting. I mean, if you paid it on the same day you got funded, that proved you paid something, you know, you'd have to then submit something that said, Hey, that actually, like, I mean, think about how complicated this could get to prove, which is why I keep on coming back to, it has to be cash-based accounting. If I, let, let's, let's just make up a scenario here where um, I pay employees um, current, like we do at BGW. So the day that I paid, I paid, um, and you're current. Like we're square at that point. Um, other so you know depending on when it fell since we pay every other week I mean there may be a week that was in there that um, shouldn't have been but in other companies you're paying two weeks in arrears <laughs> you know maybe three weeks in arrears so even a next pay cycle isn't technically for the covered period <laughs> um, potentially because it's for work that was performed and earned in an earlier period so I just really feel like it's going to be really hard to substantiate accrual basis accounting or accrual basis payroll during this period because it's extremely specific to what's your payroll policy and how, how are you going to put that down on a spreadsheet that you're going to give to the bank? Which is why, again, I just keep on coming back to it. It's going to be what your payroll company gives you <laughs> to prove that you paid the payroll. Um, and I, I don't know how you're supposed to substantiate did it cover this specific period or not? Because that's going to be very, extremely specific to what your payroll policy was, which is why I keep on coming back to, um, don't change anything for now, <laughs> but in a couple of weeks, it's quite possible you need to change your payroll pattern temporarily. Mostly because hopefully there'll be some guidance out. Next question. Are there any industries being excluded from being covered under PPP? Uh, strippers. Now, I mean, you know, basically anything that was associated with, um, you know, adult entertainment or something that was illegal. <laughs> uh, this is probably from the same person that's an anonymous and it's just as an FYI. And the reason I'm gonna read it is because we've seen this a lot of places from a lot of clients and it says we left a big bank and applied through a small bank for second round second small bank was able to submit and has responded back quickly uh, that they will be able to fund our bank account no later than thursday we'll see we've seen that too uh, and it's not to bash on the big banks uh, but some of these little ones have uh, just been like pt boats running circles around the battleships so um, next question is from Nazrin. I wanted to wait until receiving our PPP loan before applying for EIDL. 
SBA is now saying that it cannot accept any new EIDL applications while they continue to process existing submissions. Do you think they'll reopen this at some point? I don't see why they wouldn't. And thanks for that information, um, Nazrin. You know, the, the, the program, the, the only thing I believe that was um, associated with the specific funding amount was the grant, grant itself. Um, there was, I don't believe there was a cap on the amount of loans that the SBA could submit. So it sounds like that's a logistics issue on the SBA side. Yeah, this is a tough one too um, from an anonymous attendee. It says, we received our funds on Monday, April 20th. Governor Cooper extended his stay order until May 8th. If he extends it again and businesses don't open until mid to late May, we will only have a few weeks to meet what we understand. Uh, we're using your calculator. Have you heard any guidance on extending the 56 day time requirements? No, uh, we, we haven't. Um, so that I don't, you know, I, I'd assume it's, I don't, I don't see a lot of, um, I, I think it's, it, it's possible that they might grant an exception if for whatever reason you were forced to stay closed. Um, that's possible. Um, but right now there's not anything that's out there. So we got to keep on trucking towards um, 56 days. Um, if they were going to change something, it might be, you know, either 56 days or June 30th. I could see him doing something like that um, to stretch it out a little bit. But um, so far, nothing, nothing that we've seen has changed. This is a pretty familiar question that we've heard over the last few weeks, but I'm going to read it because I know there will be others that have the same question. This is from Vikas. I received PPP funds today. I'm glad for you. Good job. Um, do I need to keep these in a separate bank account? I'm having trouble getting another account established because most bank call centers have long waits. Are there any risks here? I don't believe so because again, it's just going to be an exercise in, documenting that you spent the money. I don't think there's really, an, I, I feel like moving them into a separate account and then trying to pay out of the account is um, overkill. I think you just need to prove that you spent the money in an appropriate manner. All right, this is a, from an anonymous attendee. If we meet the headcount or FTE requirements, can we make up the shortfall be, with bonuses to the employees that we brought back or returned some didn't want to come back no, no, nothing says you can't all right this is from Jennifer I understand the PPP must be used for payroll do all employees need to be on payroll for the entire eight weeks six warehouse employees were laid off the remainder of the office employees have continued to be paid now they just need you're you're just gonna need to have you're just going to need to be able to prove that they were on payroll by the time that your clock expires. So that, that means that you're going to have to at least have them paid um, once one would think as long as you still spent the money. All right. Next question is from Chris. Um, back to you answer of the 17th, and 18th forgiven because you had to release one of your 18 employees. If money is spent on the other allowable items such as rent, then it's forgiven. If spent there, do you lose 118th regardless? I believe it's 118th regardless. Because remember, it was to pay people um, and then to cover some other expenses. So the every calculation um, is driven by uh, the, the headcount and the ratio of the spend and also the restoring people back to the normal pay rate. But it, it, it's all related to belly buttons on payroll. All right, this is from Robert. If payroll spend is less than 75% and the FTE is lower than what was on the application, which will take a priority to determine the percentage of forgiven? Or is it whichever is a lower result from the forgiven calculation that determines the amount that's forgiven? Um, 
we'll have to do maybe an explainer on this one, but I think in that case it would be both because you didn't spend in the right ratios and you didn't have the headcount. So I, I think I think in that case it probably would be both. All right, this is Omar. Good to see you here, Omar. Um, any guidance on which company should pay back the PPP loan under the May 7 safe harbor provision? The SBA has mentioned public companies with access to alternative sources of capital, but various banks are saying they're going to ask for financials to determine if the loan was necessary. I go back to, I don't know how you're going to prove that <laughs> because you're basically trying to, I mean, again, just think about this for a second. Okay. So give me your financials. <laughs> okay. How do I make the judgment call on whether or not you have the resources? Um, do I like, am I now in a position to decide what your working capital target is? Um, hey, you have a high AR number, um, you know, that, but you have to then look at, yeah, but um, my collection days have gotten terrible. Uh, let's say that you have an okay cash balance and not a lot of debt. Well, what they don't know is that you have access to a million dollar line of credit because it's not on your balance sheet. So I just feel like it's not that it, it's interesting, but I go back to, and if this is the Omar that I think it is, you're an attorney. I mean, think about if you had to prove this in court, it's not freaking provable. Um, it's so subjective. And I just don't see a scenario where a bank really wants to piss somebody off. Yep, and you guessed right. It is the the Omar, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he is an attorney. <laughs> uh, okay, from John, we've deferred part of our April rent. Can we add this back to our May rent and be forgiven for the extra rent? It, again, it's cash based accounting, so um, one one would think that that's okay. This is from John. If we're going, uh, we're going to go ahead and pay our commissioned employees an average of what they made last year for the eight weeks. Is this okay? I think that's okay. Sounds like a great solution to me. Yep. Uh, from Cynthia, we got our PPP from South State Bank on Friday. Hey, we are celebrating with you. That's awesome. Um, in prior calls, you mentioned utilizing travel expenses. Can we expense housing travel for an employee that travels from her home to our offices for work twice a month? We pay this normally every month, executive housing to an apartment complex. Just need guidance on using this for the PPP. Um, so I'm going to try to unpack that one because I think there are a couple embedded um, pieces in that. So in in the case of executive housing, like we had, an, we had an employee that was working out of our Myrtle Beach office temporarily and we covered her housing expense. In that case, contractually, it was rent. <laughs> so I would have included that. Um, if you're having people work from home, and you want to pay them rent so you can expense it and have it be part of that component, the challenge you're gonna have with that is that it was supposed to be for, for agreements that were in place prior to February 15th. You know, and if, and if you didn't already have that arrangement, um, I, I just think that's gonna be, that, that one's gonna be tough. I think you'd be better off just saying, you know, hey Gary, I appreciate you working out of your home office and, and using um, your resources for the company's benefit. Therefore, I'm going to give you a thousand dollars extra in salary, which then helps solve the how am I going to deploy the money um, problem if I was going to have that if I was going to have that problem. So I probably would go that route. So in the third component of the travel expenses in terms of going to and from, you know, it. it in, embedded in there may have been an auto question. Um, and the, the guidance we've got on auto is that, um, you know, go ahead and be tracking it, but unless you're self-employed, don't count on it being allowable 
in the in that sense. I mean, if you if you've got vehicle leases or vehicle rentals, that's going to count. But if it's like, hey, we pay people for mileage, you know, that 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 looks like it applies for sole proprietors. That means that it could apply for businesses, but nobody said that yet. So I'm just very dubious about counting on it at this point. All right, this is from John. For the number of employees we need to bring back, do I average each payroll for the employee count that we use to determine the PPP loan amount? It'd be the same, you know, it'd be whatever mechanism you use for the original average. All right, and we've heard this one more than once. This is from an anonymous attendee. It says, we have employees that don't want to come back because they're making more money staying at home. How do we handle this? You got to entice them to come. I mean, it, you, it, since, since it's, well, I mean, you could try to get them kicked off unemployment, but as we addressed uh, in the last webinar, good luck with that. Um, so you're just going to have to make it worth their while. Um, and the only way that you can really make it worth their while would be to actually make it worth their while through pay, um, kind of guaranteeing them a position upon a certain date in the future or um, the other direction you can take, which would be the stick approach would be to say, all y'all that ain't coming back, ain't going to have a job when you when, 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 when I'm ready to come back. Um, I really feel like those are the only things that you have at your disposal um, to do. And the reality is, is unemployment doesn't last very long, especially in North Carolina. It's 13 weeks, if I remember right. Uh, well, remember, it was extended um, under the, the law, um, and the enhanced benefits run out in July. So I feel like, hey, if we're back in business um, by the end of July, then they're, you know, you're back on the normal North Carolina unemployment amount, which is three fifty dollars a week. So all of a sudden, they're not making um, nearly as much. They want to come back. So that's where you go back to the, um, look, I need you. <laughs> Um, I understand you're making less money. So you're, you're back with the dilemma of either paying what they would have made on unemployment, um, which, also, which also helps you exhaust the funds, um, and then figure out what you're going to do about that delta, you know, whether or not you want to have them take a reduction in the future. That, hey, that's just, it is what it is. Um, and then second, uh, you, you've got to do something around, you know, either, hey, if you'll do me this solid, I'll make sure that you got a job in the future or alternatively um, if you don't do me this solid, then you will have no job <laughs> in the future. I think are really your only, only choices. You raised a point that dovetails into Chase's question, which is, can you explain how a reduction in salary plays into the forgiveness formula of PPP loan? Yeah, you're supposed you know, they, so, you know, when you're calculating the deployment of money where that factors into place is let's assume for a minute, that you spent the money in the correct ratios and you spent every single dollar of it. Um, the, the reduction comes into play in that, let, let's say that Gary, keep it real simple, Gary made a hundred grand. Now he makes, now he's at 50 because I reduced him. This would also be in the case of the commissioned employees, right? So I reduced him. Um, relative to uh, the um, his pre two fifteen uh, pay, and then I never restored him for any payroll ever. <laughs> then you know, thinking through the mechanic, they haven't been real clear on the mechanics of the calculation. But what you would assume would happen would be that you'd have a reduction of the forgiveness amount based on that amount of that the, similar to how you had the excess of the hundred, you know, you, you would assume that you would have the reduction. You, you, the other side of that would be the reduction piece um, in, in the equation. So to fix that, what you would do is you'd bring Gary up to the equivalent of $75,000 a year for one payroll only because that gets you, that's, that's the equivalent of the FTE count, which is, you know, the safe harbor is as long as you got Gary back 
of what he was making prior to everything going uh, off the rails, you, you should be fine. Next question, is it okay to run an extra payroll on the 55th day? Yeah, I mean, you go back to cash-based accounting. I, again, I don't know how they're going to, you know, it, I, don't know, I don't know how they're going to um, audit that. So that's why we're going with cash-based accounting for now. Again, say this over and over again, don't change anything today. <laughs> you know, wait a couple weeks until we either have more guidance or we have no guidance and we're just going to do it. All right, it's a time check. It's 11.55. We got five minutes until noon, and we still got about a dozen questions uh, to go. So we'll just continue to roll. If somebody cannot stay on, we will post this on the BGW CPA YouTube channel later on this afternoon. Um, and uh, Chris, uh, you, you noticed, you said that you're late in joining, um, and we will, what I would say is, listen to the front end of this broadcast uh, and you'll go into more detail. But it, Adam, if you want to talk real quickly, uh, Chris says, can you mention again the fear factor that politicians are putting out to get companies to repay PPP because in retrospect, they may not have needed it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it still keeps on coming back to good luck. So let, let's, let's take, remember, uh, I'm a libertarian, but let's take the Republican position. <laughs> Um, hey, that's BS. You didn't need the money, but I want limited government and I don't want to hire a bunch of government employees to audit all this. And I don't want to hire people at the IRS, which probably would be the arm that would audit it. Hey, you need need the money. <laughs> um, you know, that we're going to come after you, but I don't want to hire any many government employees. I don't want to increase the federal budget. I don't. So I just, you know, I, we're going to make the banks do it. Okay. <laughs> so I just don't, other than public shaming, I don't really know what, how this is enforceable. <laughs> All right. Next question. Anonymous says regarding PPP, what are the guidelines about 401k benefits? Can we contribute to the owners of the company only as an S corp? Also, can we include loan forgiveness interest on stock redemption principle? Uh, so you got um, the, on the 401k, um, whatever you were doing before would be fine to do now um, on that. And yeah, I think that the question, you know, the, the question that you kind of have would be, all right, take, take this scenario where I did a profit sharing contribution into a 401k plan, but I always did it at the, at the end of the year or in the subsequent year. So in my calculation of eligible expenses, depending on how I did it, because I had to prove it, I was either using the 2018 contribution in the 2019 calculation or a 2019 accrual that I subsequently paid in January. So the question becomes, well, what if I paid it now? <laughs> Nothing says that you can't do that. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're paying it speculatively. You know, you might have an issue with your plan administrator actually accepting it <laughs> because you don't have any proof that that actually is going to be the number. So then what ends up happening is that you, um, would similarly get you would get the you would get the money returned to you at some point in the future. Um, that's one route you could, you could take. The other route would be the 2019 accrual that I included in the payroll that, that I either included or didn't include in the original um, calculation of what my total 2019 payroll was. Well, what if I pay that now instead of at you know September 15th when is when it's the last possible day to fund? Again, nothing. Nothing prevents you from doing that either. And, that, and in that case, the TPA would definitely take the money. I'm assuming that when the extra 600 bucks a week of unemployment runs out on July 31st, that employees may finally want to come back. Uh, do you see the $600 a week being extended? Um, 
in unless there is a significant reversal of the trends that you're seeing now in um, infection rate, death rate, hospital admittance, you know, all that kind of stuff. The, um, I don't, I don't see any sort of bipartisan compromise on um, anything extending anything. <laughs> um, the only thing I see bipartisan compromise on, because it's just got to have to have, like, you know, again, regardless of your politics, you know, a state going bankrupt because of fiscal mismanagement by people that weren't, that aren't in office anymore. Like, in other words, like, think about North Carolina. North Carolina's got a good rainy day fund. You know, way to go us. <laughs> um, but that was several administrations across political spectrums that established that, that didn't, um, it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, Governor Cooper <laughs> or the current General Assembly. <laughs> that was multiple uh, politics before. Um, and that, that's every state's the same way. So, you know, saying, hey, man, you weren't fiscally responsible. Man, that was decisions made 20 years before my time <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm currently trying to dig myself out of. So it's a long way of saying I do think there's going to be bipartisan compromise in terms of giving the states money to honor the commitments that the federal government said that they would honor, <laughs> um, which means that, you know, look, if you're running out of unemployment money, we're going to make sure that you're not going to run out of unemployment money. And if by part of that, you know, it, I had to pull money in from this, the state had to temporary pull, pull money in from other resources. I don't know the law enough to know if they can do that. You know, I totally get that um, there would be bipartisan compromise on that, but in, in, unless something goes negative in terms of the trends, I don't see a whole lot of extension of benefits or additional stimulus. Next question. Can we, pay employees that are still staying home on our final payroll during our eight week period so we can have 100% of our headcount. Again, no, you know, nothing says that you can't do that. This is from Cindy. Can we use direct hire fees paid to an employment agency against PPP forgiveness? Um, you know, I, theoretically, I guess you could try, but I would not count on that. Next question, we had a look. Yeah, sorry, let me go back to that again. It, yeah. you know, it, was, it wasn't in the original base of the calculation. That's why I feel like it's going to be hard to make that case. Makes sense. Next question is, we had a, a location shut down and employees were terminated. In comparison to head, current headcount, it'll be about half, 200 down to 100. How is this reduction in forgiveness reduction calculated? Um, it, again, it's, it's, it, it's rateable based on the percentage relative to your original reported average or, you know, 2019 equivalent um, test period 215 to 630 or 11 um, 2020 to February 2020. So you're going to pick whichever is going to be the best um, avenue for you. This is from Terry. In order to be forgiven the loan proceeds, I have eight weeks to spend the money and it's for 10 weeks time, two and a half months. May I increase payroll to include what would essentially be the additional two weeks in order to use all the funds or does the amount have to be the same each pay period no. as it was submitted when I applied? Can you bonus an employee during that time? Nothing says that you can. I mean, it, it basically, it again, it goes back to the provability of something. I mean, it take in the case where you actually do have commission salespeople and they, you know, when they actually earn commissions, that's going to by default fluctuate the amount that you're going to have in each payroll. So how would you prove that it was a bonus versus a commission versus a whatever? It's not really provable, which is why I feel like, you know, it comes down to an ethical question. This is a follow on from Terry and in, in terms of loan forgiveness, can any of the funds be used to pay 1099 employees or only those reported on W2? It's going to have to be, it's going to be payroll because the 1099ers were on their own to figure out um, their own loan forgiveness, their own PPP funding. 
This is from Anonymous. We've been paying the travel for four years. We pay for the cost of the apartment every month now. So this goes back to that question on the travel. Yeah, I mean, if you've been treating it like rent traditionally, um, you should be you should be fine. This is from Karen. We've heard this one before. Um, do we have to bring back the same employees or just have the same headcount? Um, right now, it just says same headcount. This is from Joe. On Friday, I heard an attorney for labor and employment law firm uh, Ford and Harrison state that costs eligible for loan forgiveness must be incurred and paid during the 56 day period. If true, they weren't clear as to whether this is their interpretation or a statement of fact. This negates cash basis strategy for expenditures that Alex has espoused, i.e. no prepayment, of rent, no salary advances, et cetera. Um, again, uh, that, remember attorneys are more conservative than I am um, by nature. So just let's accept that out of the gate. Um, and it goes back to the provability of the argument. Um, so in that specific scenario, I would love to have an intellectual debate with that attorney about the commission that Gary earned, therefore it's eligible um, to be included, but I haven't paid him yet, it yet. Okay, how is the guy sitting in Omaha <laughs> that just received my application for forgiveness <laughs> and has to make the call on forgiving it, gonna freaking sign off on that. Because the cash never left my freaking bank account. <laughs> I, I just, that's where I go back to, you're right. I mean, in theory, it should be accrual. But accrual is not verifiable or provable. And secondly, it was not accrual on the application process. It was freaking cash basis. So it's, it, it's a theoretical argument that comes down to practical imp implementation says that it has to be cash basis because it is not practical to do it on an accrual basis, even though theoretically that's what it should be. This one's from Jeremy. Our company got PPP funding with loan amount based on seasonal period of February 15, 2019 through June 30, 2019. Spring is our busiest time of year with seasonal employees levels dropping off in June. If we can keep average FTE count higher than 2019 for the eight week period that's covered, we're safe from uh, loan forgiveness um, reduction of the headcount, correct? Or yeah, put, you should. yeah, put another way, does our employee headcount on the 56th day matter if our eight week average is higher than the 2019 period? Uh, it, the, the, the default is average and then you're granted an exception if you didn't meet the average. So if you met, if you were higher on the average, you should be fine. This is from Karen. Is this a double up on payment to employees? If they are drawing unemployment with the extra 600 bucks and then I bring them back and make up 75% of their back wages, it seems like doubling up. That, that again goes back to ethics versus provability. Um, ethically, you know, that's, that's your own call. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't make the call for you because again, you can't, you can't necessarily prove what's going to happen in the future either. Um, but in terms of provability, all they're going to look at is what were they paid <laughs> in the in the period and it goes back to joe's earlier thing about um the department or the labor attorney saying hey it's got to be expenses um that were incurred in the period and this wasn't really incurred prove it <laughs> next question is it reasonable for us to cover home internet services for our employees who are now working exclusively at home just for the covered period this is not an expense Normally cover. Um, I I think it. You know, I, we had a con I had a conversation with a client earlier about that, and it made me kind of think about our own example. 
uh, or our own case, yeah, I, I think that that would be a utility. Um, I think the mechanics of how you would then prove it on the um, forgiveness side might be, you know, a little bit, a little bit difficult. I mean, you have to have this person probably start, you know, doing expense checks or doing expense reimbursements or like you'd have to create a policy saying we're going to give everybody 200 bucks a month to cover their telecom expenses um, during this period since we're making you work from home. So you'd, you'd have to button it up somehow, but you know, I think in theory it should be includable because it's utility. This is from Robert. If I have a loan number, am I certain that the PPP funds will eventually come? I, I think that's really good if you got a loan number. I mean, we haven't, at least in the first go round, anybody that had a loan number got funded. It just took a while in some cases. All right, this is from David at Clean Juice. Thank you, by the way, Clean Juice. Uh, enjoyed my elderberry shot this morning. Uh, question on loan forgiveness rehire provision where the bank will look at the June 30th FTE count and it'll ultimately rule what percentage of forgiveness we may get. If your coverage period ends, say on June 10, 56 days after the funding, is that day when rehire provision will be judged or is it June 30th regardless? Uh, our current take is that it's when the um, covered period ends absent further guidance. Next question, can we include the loan forgiveness interest on stock redemption principle? Oh yeah, I, I didn't get to that the, the other time. It's, it's loan interest relative to um, property that's secured by the underlying loan. So in that case, and it's supposed to be real or personal property, and stock is not that. So think about it this way. It's any interest expense that's secured by something that you otherwise pay property taxes on is going to be includable. Um, so I, I, that, that one, I don't believe so. Next question. We use a payroll service. They hold out the employee contributions to the 401k and we direct those funds separately to the plan administrator. That money is part of their wages. So wouldn't that payment also be considered in our forgiveness calculation? Oh yeah, I mean, it, it, because it's part of their, it, it shows up in their payroll. Remember the original calculation was gross wages. So if Gary decided that he was gonna contribute the 401k plan, I still use that amount in the, for the purposes of the calculation. And that shows up on a payroll report. Next question is, part of our business is a preschool. The teachers are usually paid through the end of May. How do I account for a decrease in my headcount at that time of forgiveness? Would it be worth keeping them on payroll for one more cycle and paying a small bonus? Yeah, I mean, I, you're, again, the, your, your goal is to spend the money and have it all be forgivable. So it's, you know, by, by whatever means necessary, I think you have to, to throw all those options on the table. Um, and again, I, going back to, I wouldn't change anything about what you're doing for a few weeks until there's a little bit more guidance and we're bump, hopefully more guidance because then we're starting to bump up against the end of the covered periods. This is from Megan. Can you clarify the eligibility of equipment and vehicle leases for the PVP loan? Um, you know, the way, that, the way that it reads is it's, it's rents and leases are effectively um, rents. So right now, you know, our feeling would be that it would be includable uh, absent additional guidance. And, you know, while we've had this uh, discussion, and it, it, going back to the forgiveness calculation or the forgiveness thing itself, you know, the in, in 6.30 and everything out that, that's leading up to 6.30, honestly, the easiest way to do this would be, and I'm not, I don't have any crystal ball, so, you know, please, you know, if somebody else is on a webinar asking an open Q&A, Q please don't say on that one. Well, I heard from the CPA that the government's going to do this. No, this is simply my conjecture of 
if I had to implement the policy, what would be the easiest freaking way to implement it? <laughs> um, to, to idiot proof the forgiveness, even if like a little something, something got in there that shouldn't have been in there. The easiest way to do it would simply be to say, you know, for, take, you know, second quarter payroll filing. <laughs> so I have your federally submitted payroll document, <laughs> Medicare wages, the same way the application process happened, um, divided by 90 times 56, subtraction for the FTE count, subtraction for the salary reduction, subtraction for the excess of 100, call it a day, we're square. That would be the easiest way to implement the policy in the most verifiable manner. Um, so I hope they go that route because that would negate a lot of this noise in the system that's sitting out that, that, that we're hearing through a lot of these questions. Next and last question, at least as it is right now, uh, you mentioned earlier that vehicle mileage was not covered, but what if we pay some of our employees a per diem for driving their own vehicles to job sites? Normally, they were riding in a company vehicle prior to COVID, but we implemented safety measures where everybody drives separately now. Yeah, it, so the guidance around allowable versus not allowable, remember that I just want to re-clarify again that, you know, the reason that we're a little bit leery on auto allowances being includable and then counting on it as part of getting to your 25% number is that the, the guidance around auto expenses was only in the guidance on uh, self-employed individuals, thus allowing mileage and auto expenses and stuff like that would be an extrapolation of the self-employment literature into the original business literature. And I, you know, I just, I'm, I'm nervous about that. I'd rather, I'd rather see somebody get there through the original business literature and subsequent business guidance that came out versus taking the, so, the self-employed guidance and trying to extrapolate it back to your situation. All right, if there are no other questions, uh, I do have one other comment that came in here from Charles. Good to see you here, Charles. We had our application in with BBNT on 4.5 and just moved into the next phase under review in the portal yesterday with BBNT. Next phase is signature required. So we've got our fingers crossed. So cool. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I, I you know, with, with what I've heard um, on, on the down low with um, BBNT is that, you know, pretty much if, if you were in, meaning like got it, through their underwriting process or whatever, like your dollar signs are green or whatever was in the, the, the truest system. Um, and that happened by the 9th of April, then you were going to go. Um, so I, I, I would think that would be good in this specific scenario. All right. I don't see any additional questions and uh, we've had 133 people on the line again today. So the questions, are still abounding out there. So thank you, Adam, for doing a great job again. Thank you everybody for hanging with us and um, staying tuned. And if you would, if you know of any other business owners or business leaders that are grappling with these questions, tune them in, uh, you know, pass along the, um, the registration link that you may have received they're not unique, so uh, invite them and then also direct them to our YouTube channel. Oh, we just got a couple more questions in here. Uh, oh, they're just thanks. Hey, thank you. We appreciate both of you guys and thank you, Chris. So anything else, Adam, before we say adieu? Um, no, I, you know, well, I gotta save myself for the next webinar. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. 
hey, we're going to put this thing back up, up on uh, the YouTube channel on BGW CPA uh, YouTube. It'll be up in a few more hours. Um, and then because it does take a while for us to get this thing download as a big file. So anyway, thanks again. Adam, have a wonderful day. Everybody else be safe out there. All right. Thanks, Gary. See you.